Alright guys, this is slide 6 um, of our 60's unit on uh, JFK. We have uh, two presidents uh, to cover here in the uh, 1960's unit and the first one, JFK, almost didn't become president. So let's start with the 1960 um, election. The Democrats will nominate um, John F. Kennedy. He uh, uh, from uh, Massachusetts, sorry, went blank there. The Republicans are going to nominate a young California senator and Eisenhower's vice president, Richard Nixon. Uh, so you got Kennedy versus Nixon, and it's a very, very close election. Uh, the key turning point was the televised debate. Now, the big deal about this is it's the first time a uh, t presidential debate had ever been televised live. Um, and it dooms Nixon. Kennedy had been on vacation. He was well-rested. He was tanned. He was a young, handsome guy. Nixon is all of those things, except he's none of those things. Um, Nixon had been campaigning hard. He was exhausted. Um, he was sick. He's not a handsome man to begin with. Um, he got under the hot uh, lights, TV studio lights. Uh, he started sweating profusely. He was pale. Uh, so if you just watch the debate, um, Kennedy just looks more presidential. Um, he's Again, he's tall. He's a military man. He's good-looking. Uh, Nixon's not. And uh, it's interesting because if you ask the people who listened to the debate on the radio, they would tell you that Nixon won the debate. Uh, he gave better answers. He sounded more presidential. If you ask people who watched the debate on TV, they would tell you Kennedy won the debate. Um, and unfortunately for Nixon, as this is the first televised debate, there were more people uh, watching it than listening to it. So Kennedy will uh, win this debate and go on to win a close uh, presidential election. Kennedy would be the youngest president ever elected. Uh, he was 43 years old when he won the election. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was 42 when he became president, uh, but he wasn't elected. Uh, if you'll remember, the president died and Roosevelt became uh, president because he was vice president. So Kennedy's our youngest president ever elected. Uh, he had one of the youngest cabinets. His brother, Bobby Kennedy, uh, was the attorney general for the country at only 35 years old. Um, we have what's called the Kennedy mystique. It's this aura that surrounds the Kennedy family. Um, they're seen as the perfect family in, in the country. Everybody loves the Kennedys. Everybody wants to be the Kennedys. They're all young, good-looking. They have beautiful families and all of that. Um, and the world surrounding the Kennedy White House comes to be known as Camelot. Now, Camelot is the, the mythical kingdom of King Arthur, uh, Knights of the Round Table, England, and all of that. Um, Camelot was King Arthur's kingdom. The world surrounding the Kennedy presidency comes to be known as Camelot. Um, Kennedy has, you know, the perfect family, a beautiful wife, beautiful uh, children. Um, he is seen as the perfect president. Uh, he's young. He's loved by uh, the, the people, especially the young people of this country. The college students loved Kennedy uh, and came out in support of him like they had uh, never supported any other president in history. Kennedy's domestic program will be known as the New Frontier. That's his plan for America. Um, and he gives this, uh, uh, this famous quote in his inaugural address after he is sworn in as president. Um, he, he tells especially, he tells every, all Americans, but especially the young people of America, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And the young people of America step up and they honor Kennedy's request. They ask, Mr. President, what can I do to help this country? Um, and the centerpiece of Kennedy's new frontier will be a program he's going to create called the Peace Corps. 
Now that's Corps, not Corps. Okay? Peace Corps, as in Marine Corps, or something like that. Um, the Peace Corps is a volunteer program. Young people of America, um, college students, college graduates, a lot of college graduates, when they finished college, uh, would sign up for the Peace Corps, but it's a volunteer program. People would get sent to, um, trying to think how I want to say, struggling third world countries around the globe, okay? particularly Africa, Central America, especially lots in Central America, um, Asia. Uh, but they would get sent to um, struggling third world countries around the world. People with training in education, in medicine especially, um, would go to help these countries because the thinking is that uh, if we can help them and get their economies going, get their countries building, rebuild infrastructure, if we can help these countries get up and running, then they'll like us and they'll like democracy and they won't choose communism. So the Peace Corps uh, is a it's a volunteer program. You didn't get paid. You would sign up for a two-year or three-year stint, uh, and you went to these countries. Now, the catch is you live as these people do. You don't help them during the day and go stay in the Holiday Inn that night. Um, if they, you know, eat scraps and live in a shack on dirt floor, you eat scraps and live in a shack on a dirt floor. Um, it's, it's Kennedy's way of fighting communism without actually sending soldiers to fight communism. Okay? Uh, if we can endear ourselves to these countries, they'll choose democracy, not communism. Okay? Now that's a nice little segue here to talking about foreign affairs. And as you know, we're in the middle of the Cold War, so foreign affairs almost always are going to involve the Soviet Union. Uh, and we start our, uh, our tale of Kennedy's foreign affairs battles in Berlin. In 1961, August of 61, uh, the Berlin Wall was built. Um, the Soviet Union uh, was bleeding people to West Berlin. Um, East Germans were flocking to West Berlin because the U.S.-backed West Berlin was thriving. The economy was good, standard of living was high, unemployment was low, and just on the other side of the street in East Berlin, Things were horrible. Um, East Berlin hadn't even fully been rebuilt after World War II at this point. Uh, they're still living in a, a shambles of a town. The Soviet Union had carted off all their factories. Their economy was a mess. Um, and people were moving to West Berlin. So um, the Soviet Union decides they're going to build a wall around West Berlin. It completely encircles the city of West Berlin so that East Berliners and East Germans could not get into West Berlin. The wall is not built to keep West Berliners from getting out. It's built to keep East Germans from getting into West Berlin. Okay. Um, so all those pictures you see of the, uh, the Berlin Wall with graffiti on it and all of that, that's the West Berlin side. Because you could walk right up to the wall on West Berlin side. It's a free democratic city. Um, it was on the East Berlin side that you couldn't get anywhere near the wall. Uh, you were shot and killed if you tried to go over the wall. Um, so in August 1961, uh, the Berlin Wall goes up. And it will be up for um, almost 30 years. till 1989. Okay. Kennedy is going to change his military approach to foreign affairs. Uh, if you'll call, uh, recall, sorry, Eisenhower had his massive retaliation. You know, huge bombers, lots of bombs will blast you into submission. Um, Kennedy's going to change all that. He says, that limits me. That only gives me one option. If there's a problem somewhere in the world, I only have one option. Bomb the snot out of people. Um, Kennedy wants more options. So his approach to uh, military foreign affairs is going to be what's called flexible response. 
He's going to get rid of the big, huge bombers and massive retaliation of Eisenhower. He's going to start spending money on conventional military forces again, so Army, uh, Navy, things like that. But he's also going to commit a lot of money to, now for the first time, we see special forces. The Green Berets will be created um, as a result of Kennedy's flexible response. Um, the thinking is that if I have a small problem, I can send a small force to fix it. If I have a big problem, I can send a big force to fix it. If I have uh, a problem that needs a special touch, I can spend it, send in special forces. So this gives Kennedy much more flexibility uh, in how to deal with hot spots when they pop up around the world. Okay. Um, the Alliance for Progress will be uh, Kennedy's... Um, it's called the, uh, the Marshall Plan for Latin America. Now, if you'll remember, the Marshall Plan was where we sent billions and billions of dollars to Western Europe after World War II to rebuild the countries so they didn't fall to communism. We're going to do the same thing in Latin America, Central America, South America. We're going to send lots and lots of money to those countries to get their economies up and running. Two reasons. One, a good economy there gives us somebody to trade with. Hopefully we make money. Um, and two, a good strong economy means they're not going to choose communism. Um, so the Marshall Plan for Latin America here, the Alliance for Progress, not near as successful as the Marshall Plan in uh, Europe. Good idea just doesn't quite work out the same way. Uh, and one of the reasons is that we are still very dependent on our military in Latin America. And let's talk about one big example of that in Cuba. Okay. Um, if you'll recall, at the end of our 50s unit, we talked about the fact that Fidel Castro had overthrown uh, Fulgencio Batista, the U.S.-supported ruler. Um, and Castro turned to the U.S. when he came to power and said... Uh, hey, look, uh, I know you did a lot of business with this uh, Batista guy, but uh, the business always favored the U.S. I'd be interested in doing business with you on a more fair trade. The United States said to Castro, No, go away, you silly man. Uh, you got rid of our guy. We're not doing business with you. Good luck trying to make it on your own, you silly little island nation. But Castro does not try to make it on his own. When the U.S. refuses to, business, to do business with Castro, he will turn to the Soviet Union. And the leader of the Soviet Union at this time is a man named Nikita Khrushchev. Okay. Uh, and there you see the spelling of his name. Nikita Khrushchev. You will need to spell that right because I promise you it will show up on your crossword. Um, Khrushchev is the Soviet premier who's going to be dealing with Kennedy. Okay. Um, in two big instances. The first one is known as the Bay of Pigs. This is the low point of Kennedy's foreign affairs here. Um, Kennedy is a, you know, a young president, not a lot of foreign affairs experience. He was a military man. He served in the military. He didn't lead. Um, you know, he wasn't a general or anything like that. Um, and the Bay of Pigs will be his first chance to, to be a foreign affairs president, and he's going to fail miserably at it. Okay? Um, the CIA comes up with a plan that we're going to, uh, when, let's back up a second. When Castro comes to power, thousands and thousands and thousands of refugees get out of Cuba and come to the United States. Right? The CIA has a plan. We're going to take 1,400 of these Cuban exiles, Cuban refugees in the United States, and we're going to train them in military tactics. Right? Um, and then we're going to land them on the island of Cuba where they will lead an uprising of the people and the people will overthrow Castro and kill him. We'll get the Cubans to do our dirty work for us. Um, so we train, we uh, set up military bases in Nicaragua. We train 1,400 of these Cuban refugees um, we put them in U.S. military clothing, we put them on U.S. military boats, give them U.S. military weapons, um, we land them on the island of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, where they get dropped off, um, and they're supposed to lead an uprising of the people. 
The problem is the Soviet Union has spies in the United States, and they find out what we're doing. So when the 1,400 exiles uh, land on the island of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, they are met by thousands and thousands of Castro's soldiers. The, complete, the, the entire landing is a complete disaster. All 1,400 are either killed or captured. Um, Castro is not overthrown. The people do not rise up against him. Uh, the ones that are still there love Castro. Um, the ones that hated him left. Uh, so Kennedy refuses to send in U.S. troops to, uh, to support the exiles, uh, and this is a complete fiasco. Okay? So Kennedy looks like a, you know, a, a rookie president making a rookie mistake here. But he will follow that up with the high point of his foreign affairs, once again in Cuba, uh, and this will be the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay? In October 1962, um, Khrushchev decides he is going to arm Cuba. He is going to put nuclear weapons on the island of Cuba. And from Cuba, he can reach every major U.S. city in the eastern half of the United States. So that would include Louisville. I don't know why he targeted Louisville, but he probably would have. Um, it is discovered that Khrushchev is building launch sites in Cuba. Um, so now the question becomes, what are we going to do? Are we going to invade Cuba to take out the launch sites? Um, are we going to declare war on Cuba? Are we going to declare war on the Soviet Union? Nobody's quite sure. Um, Kennedy's not quite ready to declare war just yet. So he takes the first step of blockading the island. We send a, uh, a line of U.S. military ships um, east of Cuba, out sort of on the where the... Um, the, sorry, it went blank. The Caribbean stops and the Atlantic Ocean starts, so right around there. Um, we send a line of naval ships to stop Soviet ships crossing the Atlantic heading for Cuba. Um, so we have a line of warships, they have a line of ships carrying missiles headed for Cuba. Uh, it turns into basically a big game of chicken. Uh, who's going to blink first? and the Soviets back down. The ships turn around and head back to Cuba, and the world breathes a sigh of relief. Except they don't. Uh, one ship refuses to turn around, or doesn't get the message to turn around, something. But it gets through the blockade, and it gets to Cuba. So now we have a problem. We have missile launchers built, and nuclear missiles on the island of Cuba. Uh, so Kennedy's got a, a whole nother problem here. we got a whole new ballgame. Uh, Cuba is armed, and Khrushchev has nuclear weapons pointed right at the United States. Okay. Um, long story short, uh, two weeks go by, um, and at the very last minute, a deal is struck uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union. Khrushchev will agree to take his missiles out of Cuba if the United States agrees to never invade Cuba and to remove our missiles from Turkey. We have nuclear weapons in Turkey. From there, we can reach Moscow. Um, so Kennedy agrees. Now, you might think Khrushchev won this deal. He only gave up one thing. We had to give up two. Um, but not really. Kennedy actually wins the deal here. What Khrushchev does not know is that Kennedy was already planning on, in the next couple of years, taking our missiles out of Turkey anyway. We don't need missiles in Turkey any longer. We're building longer-range missiles that we can put in West Germany and still reach Moscow. Um, so we didn't give up anything we weren't already going to get rid of to begin with. Um, to the world, it looks like Khrushchev backs down. Um, he becomes a laughing stock in the Soviet Union and will lose his job as Soviet premier. So this is the high point of uh, Kennedy's foreign affairs.